it's recording now. Mm -hmm. Yes, maybe I guess we can start if it's fine for all of you. Mm -hmm. right. So hello everybody and welcome for coming to this online session that is inside the, this symposium that we're forming from the EPS Young Minds. So yesterday we had a nice talks about Petr, from Petra Rudolph and Jane Salo. So they were explaining us to, to young researchers possible pathways to continue in academia. Remember that tomorrow at the same time we will have something similar, but uh, pathways outside academia, so in the, in the industry. And today we have a, the chance and, and the honor to have a, David Aberfeld from Nature Physics, Bart Van Tingelen from EPL and Sami Mitra from Physical Review Letters. So I would like to, to thank you, all of you for, for being here with us. So somehow uh, we're thinking like uh, you can have like a 10 minutes brief talk so you can discuss anything that you may consider of interest for, for especially young researchers. And after that, I, I really encourage uh, to the people listening to us, if any question they may have to use, so they can start writing in the chat and then we will be asking to you. So if it's fine for you, so we can start. I don't so maybe you can start, Sami. All right. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. You guys see it on full screen? Yes. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's kind of a strange setting, but uh, here we are. <laughs> so I'm just going to give you a very brief, uh, not even an introduction, just to kind of tell people who we are and what we do. And then I leave most of the uh, information for the Q&A because people might be more interested uh, in specifics, which I will not cover here. So, uh, so I am Shomi Mitra. I'm one of the editors of uh, PRL. Um, and in PRL, we have about 20 plus editors covering all fields of physics. And I would say about seven or eight of them uh, handle condensed matter physics. And I'm one of the condensed matter editors. So, um, well, PRL was, uh, it's, uh, became uh, 50 years old not too long ago. And uh, kind of the, some of the characteristics of the PRL, which uh, is that it is a large journal. It's a physics journal <clears throat> that publishes about 2,500 papers a year, roughly, which makes it large uh, compared to most other physics only selective journals. And we are not large because we um, publish a lot of papers in any particular area we happen to be large because we publish in many, many different areas in physics. So in that sense, we are broad. We cover physics from string theory to network physics, from plasma physics to uh, nonlinear optics. If, uh, if a physicist thinks that it's physics, then we are glad to publish it. Um, we also uh, aim at the same time to be also representative in each given field, by which I mean that uh, if we say that we are publishing in a particular area of physics, our aim is to publish enough papers in that particular field so that uh, practitioners in the field get a good sense of the major developments in the field in that given year. So those are kind of the uh, parameters, the four broad parameters that we kind of operate under, which uh, currently has resulted in the steady state of about 2,500 papers a year. Uh, one thing that uh, just uh, for the purposes of this conference, which you may not know, is that we are very likely, um, just like the other journals represented here, very broad uh, in a global sense, that two thirds of our readers, authors and referees are uh, based outside the US. And uh, approximately one half of the papers that we publish and the referees that we consult are from Europe. Uh, this has been kind of the a scenario for oh, well over a decade. Uh, this is just to give you a rough sense of the uh, spread of subject areas in the journal. 
as you can see, so that's 2,500, adds up to roughly 2,500. And if you consider for the, again, uh, in, in relation to this conference, uh, there's condensed matter structure and condensed matter transport, the two uh, bars near the right of the uh, plot. And if you add them up, that's uh, approximately a thousand right there. Um, so that's the bulk, uh, if you will, of the uh, single uh, subject area. And um, uh, the distinction between what is structure and what is transport in condensed matter has changed over time. So much so that to me at this time, the distinction seems almost artificial. Uh, scope and selection. This is something uh, I mentioned already is that in any given field, we are highly selective, except that we publish in all kinds of different areas. So that's the scope and selection. Uh, and one thing I think it, uh, uh, it is relevant to uh, many journals of, uh, of the type that PRL is, is that uh, most papers that we reject in PRL are not rejected because a referee is telling us that it's incorrect or invalid. Many papers, in fact, I would argue that most papers we receive are correct and significant. But to publish a paper in PRL, the editors have to determine that a case has been made for it to appear specifically in PRL as opposed to some other journal. So in that sense, I would say that a majority, even a vast majority of the papers that we reject are those where no referee is telling us that they're incorrect. It's just that our determination was that a case for PRL had not been adequately met, made. Hold on, it's not going to the, ah. This is just a chart that, uh, uh, you know, the uh, American Physical Society, which publishes, the, which publishes PRL made up for the uh, Congress, that's the politicians in the US to in effect show off the uh, very large number of wonderful papers that we have published in recent years. And uh, I think that's it. I, I really, uh, this is a chart for PRL. I don't want to go into any additional details at this point. Just wanted to give you a brief sense of what we are and what we do. And hopefully um, receive questions later on, which will allow me to uh, go into more detail as needed. Thank you. So thank you. Uh, maybe we can continue now with uh, Bart. So it's yours. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank, of course, the Young Minds for uh, uh, this very nice initiative. Uh, publishing papers is very important for Young Minds. We will come to that later, I guess. Uh, maybe I first introduce myself. Uh, my name is Bart van Tichela. I'm Dutch and I was raised as an astrophysicist in Leiden a long time ago. And I got my thesis in uh, optics and condensed matter physics. I am currently a research uh, professor at CNRS. Uh, working in Grenoble actively on, 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 on electromagnetic wave propagation and Casimir phenomena. And I do also publish in APS journals and in nature physics journals. You can, uh, you can bet on that. Um, seven years ago, I was appointed by the European Physical Society as co-editor of Europe Physics Letters. We call it EPL these days. And two years ago, I successfully applied to become editor-in-chief. Now, EPL has always had active physicists as editor-in-chief, typically spending one day per week on their job, and they are chosen on the basis of their scientific excellence, their experience in, on the in former editorial boards, and of course, their engagement. So this makes a huge difference with respect to, for instance, APS. My journal is issued under the auspice of the European Physical Society and almost 20 physical societies in Europe. That's also a big difference with the American Physical Society, I guess. We publish around 1,100 articles per year. Our publishers are free publishing houses owned by learned societies. So that's the IOPP in Bristol, owned by the IOP, EDP Science, which is located near Paris, and the French ph Italian Physical Society, CIF, that is uh, located in Bologna. I am, of course, in constant contact with all of them. And unlike Nature Springer and the APS, we are a standalone journal, though with a partnership with the other European journals, EPJ and JFIS, the Journal of Physics. Uh, 
We have an editorial board of 60 active physicists all across the world. Only the supporting services, executive editor, staff editor, production editor, are full-time jobs occupied by specialists, but not necessarily scientists. When I was appointed editor-in-chief, I had two major objectives. The first of all was gender equality, and my objective was to increase the number of women on our editorial board. And today we have come to about one third of them, which I think is a very correct number, and I'm working hard to get it even more. Secondly, I wanted to appoint young rising stars and not only confirmed researchers on our editorial board. And so I'm very happy to speak in front of young minds today. We write, right now we have about 15 young bright uh, stars on our editorial board who typically obtained their PhD only five, seven years ago and who have obtained a permanent position in the meantime. Now, following the questions that uh, Roberta and others posed, uh, I will tell you a little bit about our main struggles. Our main struggles today, our main struggle today is to have fair and transparent criteria for acceptance of papers. The second struggle is for us to attract high quality papers. And I will come to one by one. I start with the first. Now all papers submitted to EPL, and that's the difference with APS first ref letters, get scientific attention by a co-editor that knows the subject. So it gets the attention of a specialist. However, not all submissions are sent out to review, since the co-editors on the editorial board, always an active physicist, may decide that the paper is not original or not suited for broad interest. And these are our two main criteria. I am not afraid as an editor-in-chief to publish wrong papers. I'm very much afraid to publish boring papers. I'm, in this context, I encourage our co-editors to accept controversial papers that may be wrong in the end, but that stimulate scientific discussion. So I think our objectives are a little bit different than the FISREF letter. Of course, a low quality of English is also a reason to reject without review, but that does not happen very often. And even Chinese papers become excellent these days in, in English writing. Good writing skills, and this was one question, are essential to make a paper attractive. And some authors are ex very good in being destructive despite presenting their excellent research. EPL's executive editor, Andrew Mee, uh, gave a masterclass last year on the Young Mind, Young Mind Leadership Meeting about how to write a scientific paper. I agree, it is a skill that you can and should learn. Same is true for giving a seminar. We typically send out to two reviewers that typically produce a report in 17 days. Our acceptance rate is about 52%, and the time it takes from submission to online publication is on the average 3.3 months, which I think is quite fast compared to other publishers. Reviewers are more and more overburdened with requests, and sometimes they do not even reply back. One can say that peer review is compromised, whereas we know from many servers, our own, but also I think in, in the United States and by Elsevier, where I've seen it on the web, that blind quality check by peers is considered as crucial. So there is a little bit, there is a work to do in, in the near future. Now, <clears throat> very good original papers can be accepted very fastly by editor-in-chief or co-editors. They will be tagged by the handling editor and the production will then also be much faster with the possible possibility of a highlight. For instance, we had a recent paper by Professor Jorge Hirsch. Now, everybody knows him because he invented the age index. I know the paper was rejected by FISREP letters, even perhaps by, by my colleague Sami. The paper argued an incompatibility between BCS superconductivity and the second law of thermodynamics because of ohmic heating loss of the unpaired electrons. Two pillars in physics supported by Nobel Prizes, and it was submitted, resubmitted to EPL, supported by somebody who himself got a Nobel Prize. Three reviewers responded very fast, but nobody could find the flaw. If the reviewers find the flaw in the paper, it will most probably be rejected, of course. But if not, and it's not necessarily his duty to find a flaw in the paper, I consider it my duty to publish the paper and to highlight it. The community can then respond, and it did, it achieved already two comments after a couple of months. Our second problem is attracting high quality papers. There is more and more a tendency, especially in emerging Asia, to publish in journals with high impact factor. 
Unfortunately, this concerns also the young minds who are convinced that publication in a high impact journal is essential to get a job later. The impact factor of EPL is quite low, much lower than the one of Nature and many APS journals. Our policy is not to pre-select papers to have high impact or to have some kind of originality, as is the case for Nature and uh, PRL. And many distinguished physicists will tell you that real originality comes often with low immediate citations. Uh, Phil Anderson always said that, by the way. I always tell in lectures to universities of young minds or young minds that good work will eventually get the attention it needs. And in physics, this unfortunately takes much more time than two years. And this is the typical time scale to determine the impact factor. Of course, I realize very well that there is a chicken and the egg problem. My colleagues at Nature and APS get high quality papers and not in the last place because their impact factor is very high. The question why young minds should publish is in principle the same as for any established scientist. But of course, it's more urgent for those that write their first papers. Publications are the end of a scientific effort and the start of a new life inside the international community. It is a business card for any researcher and will become a basic element of its scientific records, which are used for grant evaluation and career assessment. It is important they will be openly accessible to everyone, be well written, and the content be reproducible. It is not important they be published in prestigious journals. This is the San Francisco Declaration signed by many funding agencies and scientific organizations. I want to repeat it here. Thank you very much. So, <laughs> thank you, Bert, for your words. I know it's uh, the turn from David Abergel from Nature Physics. So, you can go in. You see the slides? Yes, yeah, yes, we can see. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, I'd like to echo Bart and say thank you very much for the invitation to uh, come to this seminar today. It's always a pleasure to uh, talk both with uh, editorial colleagues and with energetic young people. So uh, this is a real pleasure for me indeed. Um, we were asked just to kind of briefly introduce ourselves and our career paths. So I'm just going to take two minutes to do that. Um, you can essentially read the information off of the slide. Um, but yeah, I'm a condensed matter theorist by background. Uh, I did my PhD um, a depressingly long time ago now in Lancaster with uh, Roger Falco. I then had two postdocs and what at least in name was an assistant professorship at a small research institute called Nordita in Stockholm. And then in 2017, I moved to uh, Nature Physics to begin my editorial career. Um, the main reason for that was that um, I actually think that scientific publishing is a often underrated part of the academic ecosystem. And it's quite clear that with the internet becoming more and more powerful with uh, all of the technology that we now have access to at our fingertips, that there is the potential for scientific publishing to move beyond you know, sticking a PDF online, um, the potential for doing interactive things, uh, for broadening the scope of what a scientific paper is, I think is quite an interesting challenge. And in particular, there are a number of things that we could do, but not necessarily all of them are a good idea. So I was attracted to the challenge of kind of thinking about what what scientific publishing might look like after another 10 years or, or so, and you know, making some kind of contribution to, to, to guide that in, in, a, in a constructive way for scientists. Um, another very appealing thing is that, as you'll see in a minute, I have to handle a very wide range of subject areas. And so uh, I've learned a lot and uh, certainly have a much better appreciation for, um, for physics in general uh, than I did before I started. So, so that's been very exciting as well. Um, now, let me just say a little bit of something about uh, our group of, of journals in uh, Nature more widely. Uh, in principle, uh, Nature has a, a mission statement here, which I won't uh, bore you by reading out loud, but um, I just want to show you this plot here, which uh, shows as a function of time, the number of submissions to the archive. And I reckon that this growth here is probably weekly exponential. And, you know, the y-axis here gets up to quite a big number. So 
the point I want to make is that there is a lot of science, there is a lot of physics being done. And part of what we see our role as being is to try to put all of this vast amount of research into context and highlight both the breadth and what we hope might be uh, somehow the best research. Um, clearly journals also manage peer review. Uh, we have uh, a role in kind of curating and archiving. Um, Nature Physics still has a print issue. So uh, in principle, if all of the world's technology was wiped out overnight, you can still uh, access a copy of that somewhere in a basement of the British Library. Um, so recording this information, I think, is, a, is an important part of, of what journals can do. Um, we also uh, try to provide a, a place for um, scientific discussion uh, through our front half content, which I'll, I'll come on to in a minute. But then lastly, perhaps nature itself also is, is in, engaged in disseminating science to uh, a wider sort of public audience and, and not just scientists. So, you know, we, we do more than just kind of get people a career. <laughs> the, the, the job is, is, much, is much bigger than that. Um, what this looks like within, within our organization is that we have this kind of pyramid of, uh, of, of journals here. Um, I want to make it really, really clear that, that what these journals do is not, is not select kind of the scientifically best work. I think that's essentially an impossible thing to even define what the scientifically best work is. We have a, we have a range of different uh, criteria that um, we try to choose uh, for, for impact and by uh, by that we don't mean citations, uh, we mean kind of originality of scientific ideas and uh, linked to that the breadth of the audience that might be interested in those ideas. Um, also as you move up this pyramid uh, you essentially get better um, kind of production and more help with uh, making the, the paper look nice, so better copy editing standards, more input from art editors and uh, other editorial staff. Um, so yeah, uh, I work for Nature Physics here, which is at this, this tier, which we call the research journals. Um, we try to serve, each research journal tries to serve a, a specific research community. So Nature Materials will, will do its best to serve material scientists. Uh, photonics will serve you know, optics and photonic communities. Nature Physics, of course, we do our best to look after physicists uh, in any way that we can. So. Um, we have a, a full-time uh, set of, of professional editors. So no, none, of, none of our editors are practicing scientists anymore. We also don't actually have an editorial board. Um, so in a sense, uh, this is a slightly different model from, from what Bart was uh, describing just now. Um, we are paid for by, by subscription. We can certainly talk about that in the, in the question time afterwards, if, if you like. And also we are very highly selective. So uh, we, we actually end up publishing something like seven or 8% of, of the submissions that we, that we uh, receive. We actually get more submissions every year and our publishing volume is, is quite tightly capped. So uh, that, that percentage actually goes down over time, unfortunately. Um, so this is the team. Uh, and a nice selection of our covers. Um, Andrea is uh, our, our chief editor. Abigail Klopper looks after uh, biophysics and, and soft condensed matter. Uh, Richard Briley is uh, the most recent person to join. He looks after a quantum and uh, some more quantum focused condensed matter. Yun Li is based in uh, Shanghai. She looks after AMO and more mathematical physics. Nina Mainzer is our optics specialist. Stephanie Reichart is in Berlin and looks after high energy physics and various things. And then I take most of the combat. So whereas Sammy's team has seven or eight people looking after combat, we have uh, myself and uh, Richard and, and Jun help out a, a little bit as well in certain places. So this is what I meant before when I said that there's a wide range of things that, that I have to, have to take care of. Um, Certainly most of the topological materials, most of the superconductivity, 2D materials, thermoelectrics, lots of the oxides and, and so on. It's a, it's a wide and varied brief, which is very enjoyable. Okay, what does Nature Physics publish? We, we kind of split our journal into two parts. Um, 
the bit that everyone is likely to be more familiar with we call the back half and this is essentially the the primary research papers we have two article formats but we also have a front half um, where we publish uh, review content so this is usually reviews and perspectives that are commissioned by editors to specific authors to write uh, we do take submissions but but typically it's that's uh, not likely to be um, to be a, a good route through we also have a more commentary section so we, we publish comments written by researchers um, research highlights which are uh, written by editors on a paper that they found cool that month uh, we have um, a books and arts column that uh, mostly has book reviews but also you know if there's a exhibition or installation that has a science or physics theme then we might review that measure for measure is our back half column uh, which looks at um, metrology and then we also perhaps most importantly have news and views there's a, a a example here so these are pieces that are quite short sort of 900 or a thousand words that aim to unpack a paper that appears in the back half uh, puts it in context, tries to explain why it's important to the widest possible uh, readership. And so for young people wanting to, um, wanting to learn a new field or access something, actually I think that our news and views are a really good place to look to try and get a kind of broader and perhaps you know, more easily accessible introduction to a paper than just by reading the paper itself. Um, so yeah, that's basically the... Uh, introduction that I had. I don't want to, like Sammy, I don't want to touch too much on the um, on the, the, the more policy stuff, but I will just flash a few uh, myth-busting uh, statements that might serve for uh, inspiration for, for questions later. And with that, thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to finish. So thank you and well, thank you uh, to all of you for, for been participating in this session. So I think now we can open the, let's say the debate or the questions. And since we are, I mean, I think we can manage, we are around 50 people. I will welcome to everybody that would like to turn on their camera. So maybe we can see each other and it looks like we are really talking to someone and not to the, to the, oh, well, I don't know, to the screen or, or to whoever. Uh, we can have two options for people who wants to make questions. Otherwise you can write it in the chat, then I can read them. Or as well, you can say that you want to make a questions and I, I think when we, we give, give you the turn and you can open the microphone and really ask by yourself because I think we can, well, we can control it in that way. So I don't know if there's anyone really has a question, wants to ask something from the moment or otherwise I, I, I would like to, to start. So we listened yesterday as well with the, pet, the talks by Petra, Rudolf and Jens, about the importance of, for young researchers to have at least five contributions or two words that you can say they, they are really what have uh, marked your, your research line. That's why you can say you are independent, you work by your own. But of course, uh, then you have to write the, the papers and send to you to the editors. So I, I really am curious, I mean, like uh, when you have uh, the piece of manuscript, you receive it, you open, what are like the key points or, or things that you usually check for deciding, well, this uh, work is going to go farther on or, or not? Uh, we already listened as well from Sami that most of the rejections are directly by, by the editor. So I don't know if there's any kind of uh, subjective bias that can help or boost. I don't know if it's a top topic, uh, figures, the, the title, if there's some big name in the, in the list of authors that could contribute or not. And especially when there's young people that still you haven't made your own name, your own group, uh, you are just, well, trying to make your, your way in science. So. Samuel, let me jump in just to correct you briefly. Oh. It's not uh, that most of the rejections are not upfront rejections by the editors. What I said was that uh, there is an element of subjectivity in that most of the rejections are not because the papers are determined to be incorrect. So we do send out a majority of our papers to referees. We reject about 30% approximately uh, that we do not send out to referees. But I think those numbers are actually uh, different for different journals. Uh, I can continue or maybe somebody else wants to uh, say what you look for at the beginning. So, I mean, we, we're essentially looking for very good science. Um, 
we actually try really, really hard to go past sort of who the names are on the paper, what the figures look like, how well written things are. And so our assessment process really, the first stage of it is to highlight or to get straight on our own mind what we understand by reading the paper that we didn't understand beforehand. So what's the step forward in scientific understanding? And then we have to make what is in some senses a fairly subjective uh, assessment, although it's an assessment that can get much more self-consistent with practice. We have to make an assessment about um, how important we think that step forward is, how big we think that step forward is, and perhaps most crucially, how broadly interesting that step forward is. So, you know, when I phrase it like that, that's essentially independent of who wrote it. <laughs> um, now, in terms of, of um, combating cognitive biases, I mean, those clearly exist, right? I'm not going to try to, try to deny that. But I think a very important step uh, along that road is firstly to understand that they exist and uh, because it's only by understanding that, that you can that you can act against it. One of the techniques that I have for myself is if I have a if I have a, a paper from um, you know people that I have not heard of before either because they're you know from from some geographical location that I that I am not as familiar with or because they're younger, I would read the paper, go through that process and you know make my decision and then just as a kind of check on my decision I would say you know what if if this paper had been written by some big shot in the field of course that will be different for different fields but you know if this had been written by professor x what what would my decision have been and i just kind of try to make sure that those two things are the same and i actually do it the other way around too you know some uh big shot named chair at harvard university sends us a paper and i go through the process and i make a decision i'm like if this had been sent to me by people who are working in india that i hadn't heard of would my decision still be the same? And so I, I try to kind of, you know, project really into the opposite scenario and, and use that as a, as a bit of a safety net for, uh, for those decisions. Well, in, in, in my case, um, uh, it, it hardly ever happens that a paper is directly arrives on my desk. Uh, it, when, uh, after the submission, the editorial office uh, identifies a co-editor who knows about the subject, and this co-editor reads the paper, or reads or has a glance at the paper, and then decides if this paper goes out for review or not. And his decision not to do it is quite legitimate. He can decide not to send it out for review. He needs an excuse, of course. He needs an explanation. And usually it is that the paper is too technical, that it has no broad interest and that it has its place in a, in a more specialized journal. This is what often you, and then the paper is not necessarily wrong, but it is simply not, uh, not for broad. Aim. That happens, most of our rejections is that, okay? And then uh, a few more, of course, because the, the reviews say that uh, the paper is wrong or not interesting, et cetera, but that happens after review. Uh, most of the reject uh, that that is most of the rejections. Uh, very many rejections happen by the co-editor itself, but it never happens that uh, I make the decision immediately. A few times because it's not always possible to uh, to identify a co-editor that 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 knows about the subject, and then it arrives on my desk, and I find somebody who or not who can uh, who can give a. But we never send away. Uh, reject the paper without any scientific uh, advice. And then, of course, what I mentioned also in my introduction, uh, if the English is very bad, with lots of typos and so on, then we simply say that we cannot accept the paper for only this reason. So we have a question from Miguel Angel Sanchez, and uh, he's asking, since you commented that peer review nowadays seems to be compromised, have you considered any potential alternatives to the current model? For example, hiring reviewers as external consultants? Well, I guess the you is me. So I will start uh, answering first. 
the answer is yes yes because i think the peer review process is very precious to the whole editorial process so we if if there is if it is compromised at some point we have to find a solution and that's what we do and with uh, executive editor we are continuously looking out for solutions uh, this is one solution which will cost money okay because you have to hire them and pay them and so on and not everybody is in favor of that uh, because a lot of people say, including myself, that reviewing a paper is part of your duty as a researcher. And so why should you pay for it? You already have a salary. And that, that is one thing. Um, uh, but then there are commercial enterprises these days that uh, do the reviewing and, and they are good. Uh, I forgot the name, but there is one uh, in Europe. And um, we, 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 this is for us, for us absolutely a solution. And then, of course, there is an, uh, a third solution that, well, we don't know if we are going to do that. But I like this solution because it breaks the subject a little bit open, is to publish reports. And that is also something because what happens these days, you know, as a reviewer, you spend a lot of time reading the paper, getting the references, understanding it, uh, talking to colleagues. So it will take typically a day, you know, to review in, in a good fashion a, a paper. And then you write a review. So it's a lot of work. And then after editorial decision, it happened, it, it, it just disappears in, in office and it will never pop up again. And so it's, and, and you will never, nobody will know your name because the review process was blind. Only the editor knows, but uh, he forgets about you. So you know, there, is, there is a problem of, uh, of, 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 of uh, justifying the existence of, of a reviewer. And that, that I think is, if we find a solution to that problem, that would be really a solution, I think. And uh, that is what we're looking at for. But it's, it's very easy because, uh, very difficult because, uh, Identify publishing the report means that you need some kind of uh, a proof from the reviewer, and then you have to uh, well rewrite the report because uh, a report as it is can never be published uh, because you have to get rid of trivial statements and so on. But uh, I I would like to hear also from the young minds here present what they would think if a review would be published openly and, and if they were if, if they would have been the referee of a paper. It's a inter very interesting discussion. Can I briefly? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I, I should say that actually Nature Communications already does this. Um, not for all of the papers, because essentially the authors have to opt in. Uh, but I believe it's, it's certainly more than half of uh, the papers published by Nature Communications have the reports online um, with them. Uh, so it's, there's a fair chance that people uh, here have already uh, I've done this, been, been involved in this, I guess. Yeah, as you might imagine, we've discussed this off and on over the years. I mean, there are all, I mean, there are pros and cons in, 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 in both directions. So one thing, for example, is for a journal like PRL, much of the refereeing process takes place on papers that are eventually not published, right? So we uh, review papers and the majority of them do not get published. So that whole process you would not see. So you would not see how referees kept out incorrect unsubstantial papers from getting published. There's that. And the other thing I would also uh, worry about a little bit is whether, I mean, in PRL, for example, we fairly often publish papers where at least one referee was telling us to not publish it. Uh, sometimes on subjective grounds, sometimes on some science grounds where it was a one referee said scientifically invalid, but the others said, no, that's a uh, detail and so on. So I'd be uh, interested in knowing, and I haven't looked at the nature communication spread, for example, is whether authors would routinely agree to have their papers published with a hanging, very negative report hanging on it, which basically spells out exactly how this paper was incorrect. Uh, in a sense, I think when journals decide to publish papers, they have to take ownership. I think one way it would work, and I would agree with Barton that, is if every paper, or if every, it was not a choice in a sense that all papers were submitted and then published with the assumption that uh, referee reports would be made public. I think there's some issue there as to even if your, uh, uh, your, your report is not named, if you're in the field and so on, there is some possibility that uh, I think junior researchers would be reluctant to write scathingly negative reports on 
papers from big names. I think that is a reality, even if you show them that the reports uh, would not, would be published, but without their names on it. I think these are all concerns. I, it would be interesting to try out, I think, a scenario where every paper did have reports with them. So, El Angel, did that answer your question? It's a Yes, but it's, it's all about the recognition of the reviewer. That, that I think that's the basic item, and there is no genuine solution, unique solution to it. But the recognition of a reviewer, a database. I mean, uh, I mean, at the APS, for instance, and I think also in Nature, they have this principle of a recognized reviewer and so on. A nice diploma. I have it standing behind me here. It's a, it's, it's, it's. You know, it's, it's, it's something. We can think of, we have it at EP also, mm -hmm. we have uh, diplomas for very active referees. We have referees, some reviewers, they, they produce seven reports, eight reports each year. So, uh, you know, they spend a lot of time on it. And uh, I think for the young researchers here present, in the beginning, they will have very few papers to review, but I can assure you, as your career goes on, it will be more and more and more and more. And then the grant proposals come and so on and so on. And I have continuously about four or five requests for review on my desk, not even my own journal, but just as a researcher. I, I can just say one other thing as well. Something yeah, sure. that we've, we've started doing quite recently, uh, not publishing the reports, but we've given the reviewers the option to be acknowledged in a footnote at the bottom of the paper. So at, at the bottom, it will say, we thank Professor X, Dr. Y, and the other anonymous reviewers for their contributions to the peer review process of this paper. So in terms of um, uh, basically just saying thank you, that's something that we can do. As with everything, there are downsides to it. Um, but I think that's that's an option too. I also, personally, I really like the idea of, of initiatives like Publongs. I, I know that it's kind of gone downhill a bit recently, but having some centralized database that isn't just linked to one journal, but has a record of um, how many peer reviews people have been doing, I think I think having that is, is helpful because then it allows you to um, use that information on a job application or, you know, tenure, application or something like this um, and you know having that data sort of verifiable I think is is a good good option too I, I'm, I'm a bit sad that that's not been as successful as, as I hoped it would be. I think Bart also mentioned you know the APS outstanding referee which is um, yeah, I think it's uh, well regarded it's a uh, but unfortunately there's a cumulative aspect to that uh, process so people who get recognized are perhaps further along in their careers than the, uh, you know, than the younger scientists. And uh, we don't have a separate, uh, at this point, uh, a recognition of people in the early career stages. And that would be something more of an encouragement than a thank you in a way, right? I mean. So we have a question from Saul Garcia and he's asking, uh, what should be the number of publications per year for a young researcher? And should we change our group if we don't publish in impact journals? I think that's a very complicated question and there are many, many answers. I think it very much depends on what field you're in and what the, uh, what the uh, recognition procedures are in your particular field. So for example, if you are, let's say a researcher working on some experiment at CERN, the answer is gonna be very different than if you are a researcher working on superconducting qubits uh, experiments. And that answer is going to be very different from if you're a researcher working on superconducting qubits theory, because, you know, different journals have different focuses and so on. I think part of it also the incentives, uh, we can talk about it at length, it's a long discussion, have gotten skewed because of the, uh, at various stages, whether it's promotions or funding agencies or particular um, organizations within particular countries giving somewhat um, uh, misguided, if I, you know, if I might uh, focus on impact factor. I mean, one way to think about it is um, to think of it this way, that if you are uh, a young researcher who's an experimentalist on a big um, uh, high energy group, it's not the, uh, just the impact factor or even, even the um, yeah, H index that matters, because those numbers are going to be much, much higher than anyone can get at the same stage in a condensed matter theory group, for example. So one of the ways to look about it is, you know, how many papers 
you know, uh, some consideration of the, in, in your sense, the best five, if you will, you know, the best five papers and what you did on them and that kind of, as opposed to just relying on the, you know, what I would term the lure of lazy metrics. And that's uh, one way to think about it. I mean, but that is not just the journals. I think it comes from all these agencies also, the pressures and the uh, incentives. Yeah, I, I would like to agree completely what Simon was just saying. And I would also like to warn, I, I, I want the young minds already several times on different presentations I made uh, uh, about quantitative indicators about the quality of research. Okay, and this question about the number of publications, which of course happens to depend on many, many on, on the community. If you, if you are a mathematician, you publish one completely high quality paper every three years you can get a field medal just one paper you know? and then that, that and the community will perfectly accept it and and, and other pay and so th this number is very dependent on the community and it doesn't really say anything about the quality of your research the number of papers is i mean i would plead much more for the quality of your research and like many senior researchers here i mean i'm also often in in in, in assessment juries and so on in promotion juries and we look at the quality of of, of the work and not uh, and some you know sometimes there is an experiment i'm in grenoble a lot of people work on superconductivity and they have they have a, a a graph with five points and i know that every point took them one year of research one point okay so you can see but in the end they have 10 points on a curve and they confirm a rigorous theory there's five points you can make a line so that's a fantastic paper i mean but you have to appreciate that you have to read the paper that's why uh, I would say I would encourage, especially young minds, you know, not to bother too much about age indexes and about numbers of papers and number of citations and so on. And just make sure that your, the quality of your group, the quality of your work is best you can make it. Well, in this particular case, he was referring to polymers and optoelectronic characterization. But yeah, I guess it's, it's generally the answers you, you gave. This is in line about asking about the, the reference of the, the referee, sorry, uh, and, and young people. When, when you have to choose a referee, what is what you are looking for? Because somehow you expect a, an expertise, so then this is just for, for elders or for senior people, this is just normal, they have more, they have more experience. But then uh, what, it, what can be a, a, a referee to be young? I mean, I don't know if you are thinking about the 30s, about the 40s, about the 50s. You choose people, I don't know, maybe you know them and you know they are very on in the field, they know all about technical details, maybe with uh, less than 30 years old. I, I don't know uh, how you handle this topic. Well, there is, there is one thing that you have to realize before we start the discussion that very good referees, okay, very experienced referees, very experienced researchers, they usually have no time to review, okay? The more they are experienced, yeah. the less they have time to review. Now, with the young minds, it's exactly the opposite. They may not have experience, but they have much more time and they spend much more time on reading a paper. And, and if you ask the review of a very experienced uh, researcher, you often get a two line report that the problem that it happens to me that it comes from a Nobel Prize instead. And then you just get a two line report that I accept publication, the, the, the paper is interesting. That, that's the report, okay? And, and this will never happen with a young mind. A young mind, it will be at least 20 lines of, of, of arguments and questions and so on. So maybe the ideal case, you need both of them, I guess. And I, I as an editor, I'm never afraid of asking uh, young researchers for their, for their, for the opinion. So that's, uh, but uh, you have to realize that they, that experienced uh, reviewers, they have less time to do it. So. Mm -hmm. I think uh, one of the things that technology has helped us with is that now if I give you, you know, someone's name, one of the participants here, with the click of a few buttons and a few databases, you can get a very good up-to-date sense of what they're doing, what they're publishing and so on, you know, Google Scholar and such. Uh, so that has helped us very much in, in, you know, all editors in seeing you know, who does what and what the relevant and, uh, expertise is and therefore, you know, bringing in young people into our database, for example. I think this was a big challenge even 15 years ago when you kind of knew uh, in some sense, but to do large scale, you know, lookups was difficult. 
Um, yeah, so, uh, but one of the central challenges I believe we all face as editors is that sometimes you have a situation where, you know, you have a paper, let's say, on topological insulator, transport and topological insulators, and you could, um, you know, with the help of a database and so on, if, you, if I gave you an hour, let's say, you could come up with a list of 100 people that you think would be good experts that you can consult. But then you do some kind of, you know, um, filtering as, uh, you know, who is available, who said last week that they are going on vacation, uh, who has just returned a report to me and uh, who never ever submits a report within less than, you know, two months. And if you apply those kind of filtering, uh, then uh, pretty quickly that list of 100 becomes something like 20. And then so then in effect, you're often, unfortunately, not sending the paper to the best and most appropriate referee. You're sending it to the best, most appropriate available referee at that time. And so that is reality. And uh, that is, uh, you know, what we, uh, that, uh, to me, that's one of the bigger challenges than just knowing who is a good researcher capable of reviewing the paper is important, but also are they available? Can they do it now? I, I think it also depends a little bit on what the main goal of the peer review process is so i mean it i mean firstly the most important thing has to be to weed out uh manuscripts where basically the data don't support the case that the the authors are trying to make right so there's a question of whether the paper is kind of correct in what it's uh in what it's claiming um and for that, you need people who understand the measurement techniques or the theoretical techniques uh, to be able to find um, find any potential errors. So, you know, if I have some some paper on topological materials that has some RPEs, some STM, and some DFT, I need somebody who understands STM, somebody who understands DFT, and somebody who understands RPEs to be able to check all of those technical details and make sure that you know we're not publishing something that is going to be kind of obviously technically wrong. Um, but then after that, you know, you also kind of, at least I would hope ideally that, that peer review is kind of a constructive process, that it's not just about knocking papers down or trying to block your rival's papers or anything like this. It's not, not necessarily confrontational. It, it can be about um, trying to make papers better, trying to make papers easier for, for wider ranges of people to understand, communicate things better, include data that makes the point more cohesively. And so you ideally looking also for people who are going to engage in that process constructively and be helpful as well as just uh you know uh trying to be trying to be sort of combative about things so there's you know you, you don't know this up front but in terms of who you go back to as an editor like if there are constructive people rather than combative people then then that really helps a lot because i think in general constructive peer review is a much better thing for science than combative peer review thanks so we have a question by Edwin Herrera. He's asking, in the H index era, platforms like SCH having rise access a lot of published papers for the scientific communi community just by free. This phenomenon has a big impact on the H index because more access to published papers can be traduced in more citations, a raising of the X index thanks to a free platform. Apart from the legal situation with the SC Hub, which are the options to increase free access to your journals to avoid the use of this type of platforms? Well, maybe I can react quickly on this on this question because it's a very common discussion, uh, especially in Europe where there is the Plan S. And I think that uh, I agree with the uh, statement that we need open access of papers. I mentioned this already in my introduction. I don't think it's good to start immediately discussing SkyUp because that's an illegal uh, company, you know, that that, that puts copyrighted papers online and, and, and we, sh we, do, we do not want that, okay? That's, that's, nobody wants that, even the, pay, even the people who want open access. I think it's very important to have open access of journals. Uh, in physics, uh, we, have, uh, we have the archive for the, for the preprints and the postprints and uh, my journal perfectly allows posting preprints and postprints. So that is a technical discussion, but uh, it can be done. It, we are not allowed to post the, the, the publisher's version, but our journal is in favor of open access exactly for this reason and not necessarily to increase your index, your age index, because that's again a quantitative argument and there's nothing to say about quality. 
but the open access, yes. And so in Europe now, these days, we have this plan S that uh, different agencies, funding agencies, they say that all the money we give you to do research, we want you to publish the papers open access. Okay, that's what they say. And it's about 14 funding agencies in Europe, including the European Commission. So that is something. Well, the European Commission greatly step back a little bit on this uh, on this discussion but nevertheless there is a big tendency in europe to go open access and my journal as a as a learn society journal uh, is a little bit is in favor of this commitment but on on, on the same uh, on the other hand it's very difficult for us to 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 switch to open access from one day to the other it's it's very very complicated because the economic system we have subscription based system is, is you cannot change that just from, from one day to the other, okay? And what the plan S advocates is that there will be uh, a, a gold open access so that, that the reader pays in the subscription, uh, but more the author pays upfront upon submission. Uh, and, and, and that transition takes time. In the UK, they started it and well, it was not really a success. In the Netherlands, I know it is a big success and this is just common law, man. And uh, well, I, I think in America, in the uh, it, this discussion did not really uh, start. Maybe I don't know, but but I do know that APS started many journals that have gold open access, like uh, Physical Review, uh, Physical Review X, and also Nature Communications, of course, that Nature as, uh, as scientific reports have open access. But EPL is not is not an open access journal. We are what we call a green open access. So our open access comes from the posting on the archives. So some of you want to comment that, otherwise yeah, we can... I, I think, uh, I mean, everything Bart said, I agree with. And uh, I mean, I think the incentives towards moving a substantial uh, amount of any publisher's portfolio towards open access are strong. Uh, as, as he noted, uh, uh, APS has, in fact, APS's latest journal, which started publishing, I believe, uh, yesterday or the day before, I forget, is PRX Quantum, which is uh, kind of an... Uh, open access, publishing in all aspects of uh, quantum information, quantum transport and so on. So that's open access. Uh, it's a, I don't know of this connection between a high number of citations as indicated, I think in this question with the H index um, and, and, and being open access is, uh, is particularly strong. I mean, we have papers in some areas where I don't think there's a strong correlation. Maybe there are in some other fields. My point is that I don't think the paper has to be open access for it to get a high number of citations. It's a separate issue. The incentives are in all kinds of, I, I really don't know where it'll settle. It's also unclear to me that, uh, you know, open access is viewed as egalitarian in a particular way, right? It's because the readers uh, do not pay, but the author pays. So it's unclear to me, for example, if you are a, a scientist in a developing country, let's say, and uh, your funding is limited, is it more egalitarian if there is a countrywide uh, deal for you to access all papers in a particular journal, as opposed to having to pay from your individual funds for open access? I, I don't know, but these are issues that uh, mm -hmm. one has I mean, to I, about. I, I, I tend to think that actually, like at the moment, you know, we're going through a bit of a quench. We, we're not we're not in the equilibrium or in the steady state for for the long term at the moment in in terms of. Um, where things are going to settle between uh, subscription and um, and and open access. So, the other thing to point out, actually, I think, is that um, subscription journals and gold open access, where the author pays, are not the only options. Uh, there are other options. So, for example, the way things tend to work at the moment in in at least bigger universities is that researchers get grants. The universities take some overhead off of those grants a proportion of those overheads go to the library who pays for the subscriptions. It could be in the future that in, instead of, of that pot of money paying for subscriptions, it could pay the APCs for, for open access. So it's not, it's not contingent on the individual researcher to pay for uh, everything from, from, their own, uh, from their own funding. So yeah. you know, that's, a, that's a tweak to the system. Another possibility, and this is something that I know that Spring and Nature are pursuing quite strongly, is to have these uh, read and publish deals with either uh, either on a national level or 
with a consortium of, of universities where, I mean, the details will be hammered out each time, but, you know, you essentially get a certain number of open access publications and also subscription access together in a package. Uh, and that also is a way to kind of share the costs um, away from kind of individual groups research budget. So, you know, these, those sorts of things are, are, I think, probably in the long term, more promising options to sustain open access. Um, as I said, I was a combat theorist. The, the thought of spending $5,000 to publish something in Nature Communications is, is, was pretty horrific to me when I was a researcher, right? I'm, I, I, don't, I can't pretend otherwise. So, you know, I, I think we're still finding what the ground state is going to be in the long term. I, I, I don't think we're quite there yet. I think there's more evolution to come on that issue. So I agree. As David said, this is in a state of flux and we're nowhere near a steady state. And unfortunately, the uh, overall global funding situation in this particular time that we are in has gotten even more complicated. So that steady state may be a little further away than we were thinking even six months ago. So. I agree. This, this is definitely true. And even in different countries in Europe, the policy towards open access is different, okay? So in the Netherlands, for instance, I know this is really the gold open access that has been, uh, that is completely uh, defended. In France, it is really the green open access. So you have to deposit your uh, post-print, pre-print, post-print, well, that's not a technical question, the discussion, on the archives, national archives, CONTMAT, whatever you want to, to do so. Uh, we talk about CERN, for instance, CERN has already a very sophisticated open access system, which is called Scope Free, and uh, made deals with APS and other journals uh, to, 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 to pay upfront the APC for gold open access. Uh, and that's very good, I think. But it's very difficult, again, for, for countries to, to switch from one model to the other within a couple of years, as is demanded by the planners. I mean, they want us to switch within a couple of years, 2021, 2022, using a transformative agreement like Publish and Read that David mentioned. But the Plan S has already said that the, 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 the Read and Publish deal that the Germans made with uh, Springer, okay, uh, is not recognized by them. So it's, it, it's a very complicated situation, which is really far from equilibrium, as you say. <laughs> In this sense, we just got a comment from Fernando de Juan that he's saying that there's yet another option for this. There is a journal called Essie Post, which is free to publish and read, and it's funded directly by research agencies. Have you followed this? And do you think this can be escalated to a large size journal? I, I know this very well, and I know the editors in chief very well. I think it's a very good initiative, very, very good. Okay, um, uh, it is what they call diamond uh, open access. So it's not the reader that pays, not the author that pays, but somebody else. And this somebody else, in this case, is the, is the research organization. I want to make one comment on this, okay? And I discussed this also with the, uh, with the editors, because they say that uh, their publications, they cost, uh, I don't know, $100 or something like that, okay? But they forget uh, a normal APC, so a normal fee you have to pay for gold open access is about $1,500 dollars or euros, 2,000, much more for nature communications, but okay. And um, uh, my point is that they, you, you have to be transparent in all your costs. If nature says, this is my APC, my fee, then all the costs are in there. And the same is true for the American Physical Society. There are no hidden costs, okay? This is, this is all it takes for a publication to, to, to publish and, 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 and to make some profit. Now, in their case, in the Skypost case, I know they, the research organization pays for it, but especially pays the salaries, okay? So the editor-in-chief, one of them is in Lyon, and he is a, he is a very high, high uh, uh, quality uh, research professor with CNRS, but his salary is not in, in there, okay? So the job that Sammy is doing for, for APS, you know, is his salary is not counted. <laughs> but I think for APS, his job is counted. His salary is counted in the APS. You know? it, it, it's budgeted. And so I think the SkyPost has to be open and completely transparent in their, in their costs. And, and if they count for that, then they will see that the research organization pays, you know, a professor salary for two days a week, which is quite significant. 
So uh, yeah, I think I think the problem with scalability of something like SidePost isn't necessarily the number of papers or or how big the journal is. I I think the problem is more um, is is more related to to, to costs and, and salary. So for, for example, I, I showed that pyramid in 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 my slides and didn't go into it in detail but hinted that there is you know as you go up that pyramid there's more input from more people to try to make papers you know a bit nicer somehow so you know we at nature physics we have an art editor who who helps out with the figures we have copy editors who take really careful care over um over making sure the text is is as is as clean as possible and you know those people have to be paid you know they're not going to do it for free so you have you essentially have two options. You can either say, well, it doesn't really matter about that stuff. We'll just put the PDF that the authors provide onto the internet. And that's a completely defendable position if you, if you, like, if you like that. Perhaps actually it's better for science if there are people paid to do things like edit figures and copy editing and even possibly editing in general. And it, it, it's a question of, of how how much effort you want to put into that, into the publication process. And if you want to put minimal effort, then yes, you can probably do it for something like $100 a paper on, as SidePost do, modulo their hidden costs. If you want to do it uh, with a bit more finesse, then it's going to cost a bit more money. Um, the other side to it also is, is uh, at least when it comes to editorial time, SidePost, I, as I understand it, publishes the vast majority of what gets submitted to it. At Nature Physics, we publish, you know, seven or eight or nine percent of papers that are published to um, submitted to us. And so, if your revenue for the journal or you know the the income is based on approximately uh, based on publishing approximately ten percent of papers, that ten percent of papers has to cover the costs of all the other ones. I mean, in particular, the editorial time in assessing them and you know, finding peer reviewers for the ones that that, uh, that get sent out for review but, but don't get published. And that doesn't scale very well. So selectivity is also a massive problem when it comes to scaling a model like that. Again, you could say we don't need selective journals. That, that's a perfectly legitimate opinion to take. But if you want selective journals, if you want journals that, that have relatively high production values, then you can't do that for the sort of money that's, that SidePost does. It, it, just can't, it just can't work. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So we have a question from Salome Forel. She's asking about uh, the blind process for reviewing. So if you uh, agree with this Adobe blind process where both editors and referees don't know in the first place who should miss the paper. I can so, take, oh, go ahead. Some, yeah, go on. I, I think uh, I can take, it's kind of somehow tied a little bit to that, uh, in a way, the flip side of uh, uh, making reports public. I think many years ago, even before my time, uh, PRL used to allow by blind, uh, double, this is called double blind. Uh, in, uh, double blind means that the referee, what we now have is the uh, authors do not know who the referees are. And double blind would mean that neither party knows you know, so the author doesn't know who the referees are, the referee doesn't know who the authors are. That would be double blind. And we offered it uh, about 20 years ago, but turned out that very few people were requesting uh, their papers to be considered double blind. And there was a high correlation between people who were requesting it and the likelihood of their paper being rejected. And I think uh, then of course, two things happened and I think the first thing is the uh, arrival of the archive where, you know, in PRL in particular, there are areas such as, uh, you know, theoretical condensed matter physics, for example, where uh, I would say 90 to 95% of the papers that we receive have been on the archive for days, sometimes weeks before they arrive. And of course, you know, in those instances, the authors would not have wanted anything like, double, you know, double blind. And the other uh, thing is also, um, the question is, if you have, imagine uh, some mid-career, reasonably successful person who has done some amount of work in their field, how could they possibly write a paper in which they do not refer to their own earlier work or uh, leverage their name recognition, which is you know, a sociological thing we can get into. So basically the only people who would request double blind are people who have essentially no track record in that field. And that in itself creates a negative bias against their paper. 
Anyway, so I think it's a scenario where, again, I think it would work if a journal uh, said every paper that we review and publish will be done under the double blind review process. So same ground rules for everyone. That might work, but I think a scenario in which we can get, uh, you know, um, good track record people to agree to that scenario is uh, very small. Yeah, I would be tentatively in favor of mandatory double blind peer review. I think, I think that might help a little bit, but preprint exists and it, it, it makes it, it makes it almost meaningless somehow. And just to very briefly address the question about editors being blind to author identities. Um, that, that can only go so far because you have to make sure you don't invite the authors of the paper to peer review it. Um, That's triple instance. blind, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so, but I mean, personally, what, I try actually quite hard not to look at the author list until I've read the paper. Um, I try to have my first impression of a paper, which I think is actually reasonably important because I'm human. Um, try to have that first impression being as blind as the author identities as possible. But I mean, at some point, it's just unavoidable that editors have to know uh, who the who the authors are for, for practical reasons, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I agree with David Asami uh, with the, uh, the the arrival of preprints on the internet. It's very difficult to 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 get a blind or triple double blind. Uh, review process and I would like to add that I have been doing seismology for a while and seismology if you do uh, if you look for seismic waves in the earth crust and so on it's a very small community it's not like superconductivity so the number of people working on that is uh, maybe uh, maybe 200 and that that's everybody in the whole world okay so and the probability that everybody knows each other they heard each other on conferences the, the, it's very difficult to have it blind because you can guess from the right first sentence already who is the author of the paper okay so there are several do domains also in physics or in uh, some interdisciplinary uh, applications where it's simply impossible to do double blind mm -hmm. now we have a uh, victor barrena that is asking about if you have ever noticed personal conflicts permitting into the peer reviews and how you deal with that I think I'm, uh, uh, if, if you are a researcher yourself, like myself, okay, then this risk exists, okay? Uh, I think it will exist less for, 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 for professional editors who have no active career going on in, in physics anymore. So that's, uh, uh, and, and then th this, is a, this is a real problem for me, and, and it happened to me that uh, I have to make a decision on papers about people I know very well or part of my lab. Uh, and, and, and I also have to be very careful that I delegate the decision. So we have a system at EPL, we can easily delegate. At EPL, I'm the editor in chief, but we have two deputy and now even three deputy editors, and they can, uh, they can, they can make a decision for me at any time. But the, the most important thing is to identify uh, the conflict of interest, because that's a very important thing. And it's a very, it, it, you, we should circumvent it, absolutely. Yeah, I think uh, in um, in PRL, I mean, even though most of our editors are uh, professional editors, uh, across the APS, we have both kinds. You know, some of them are part-time editors with, uh, and I, I'm not sure. Um, I think, yes, there's always uh, a possibility that something will spill over from one scenario to the other. People are wearing different hats. I think one of the ways to approach it is what we do at PRL and the other journals is we have, you know, every paper has a record, right? I mean, the referees, reviews, uh, resubmission letters, and what went through the review process and so on. And that is all recorded. And it's not visible to the outside world, but it's our approach is that it should always be logical and, and self-consistent. So in other words, it is almost as if, let's say you are the editor who is in charge of the paper and the review process is carried out and decisions are made negative or positive. What you don't want is somebody, let's say Bart, for example, we said, all right, we will give you uh, temporary access to the whole file, names will be revealed and so on. And you know, you sign some kind of confidentiality. Our thinking should be that if he were to look at the file, his thinking would be, all right, uh, these guys, given the information that they had and the players and so on, the decisions made were, you know, it's never a binary decision, but the decisions were logical and not completely, you know, uh, improper. So that's the way we approach it, that there has to be a track record 
which if we were to make it available to some outside arbiter of, uh, uh, or, you know, it would make complete sense to them. That's the approach uh, we look at them. So, so everything is recorded. Everything is, uh, as you said, transparent, at least to the insiders. That's so I, I interpreted the question a bit about, have you ever seen instances where there's been personal conflict between referees and authors? So maybe I can just say say a little bit of something about that. Um, it, it does sadly happen. Um, there are a number of things that we can do. Uh, firstly, at least at least in our in our case, authors are free to ask uh, for certain people to be excluded as reviewers. So we do our very very best to honour those requests. There's a there's a box on the submission form, or you can put it in the cover letter. If there are reasons why why you think certain people are not going to not going to be constructive uh, as peer reviewers, and you know, so long as the list isn't too long, then then we 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 will honour that. Um, when things just happen, when when things spill over, when things get tense, uh, it's essentially up to the editor to step in and uh, uh, sort of adjudicate things. I, <laughs> I I kid you not. I I actually once had authors accuse the referees of using the same logic as the Nazis did in order to get rid of their paper. That report was never shown to the authors. Uh, I went back to the referee and said, look, this is not how we do things. Uh, you can't take the rhetoric to that level. Please reframe your report uh, and then we'll, we'll send it to the author. So, so there is a role for editors to kind of de-escalate things and to try to make sure that um, at least some of that more personal stuff uh, isn't, uh, isn't um, you know, doesn't permeate through through the thing. Also, when we're choosing referees, we do have some checks for people who uh, might be in obvious conflict. You know, if you know, we check the archive to see if if people have preprints on similar topics, um, things like this. So, so we try to we try to select referees who are less likely to have that kind of personal conflict to begin with as well. Um, and actually, I should say, referees are often very good at. If I send a send a request to somebody. I, it's not an, at all uncommon for them to write back and say, you know, I'm working on something very similar. I've probably got a conflict of interest here. It's better that I don't review it. So, you know, there, there's a there's a there's a role for individual referees to play as well in in accepting or declining uh, peer review requests. So, you know, I think in general the system is not completely terrible. There are obviously cases where things go wrong, but but I think they're relatively rare, and I think that's down largely to the integrity of individual researchers. And I think that's still quite, um, you know, that's something that we can celebrate as a community. I think it's 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 not terrible overall. Yes, it did. because the peer review, I agree with David, is is uh, we are all part of it. No? Okay, we are all part of it. And uh, and it's good that David mentioned this. We have also uh, a line somewhere in the request to a referee that that if there is a conflict of interest, then he should withdraw. That's that's what we ask him because we, all editors do this job to find reviewers that have no conflict of interest, are not directly concerned, are, and have not been ten times co-author of the authors and so on. That, but it, it's very difficult and sometimes we just miss it and, 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 and then most of the reviewers say honestly that uh, I was his PhD supervisor or something like that. You know? it, it happens all the time but most of the cases I see things happen very very well. I agree with David. Yeah I would also yeah I would add also that you know for us editors uh, the decisions uh, our aim is to try to make the correct best decision given you know given what we have at hand and so for us to go into um, we are kind of mindful of these additional complications that can arise because of these personal conflicts and as David said we you know we don't want to make things complicated so if a, if a, if an author says that I may have a conflict of interest with referee A and it seems reasonable to us that this claim of the author is what it appears to be then we would much rather not have that hanging over the review process. We would like it to, uh, the review process to be, you know, disconnected from these complications. So, so and as both of, uh, David and Bart said, uh, we also have a field in the submission form where you can specify people you think we should consult and specify people you think we should not consult. And we really uh, pay close attention to that. So it's, 
in your interest when you submit a paper to make use of those fields. So if I haven't missed anything from the chat, we have a, a last contribution from Martin and he's saying, from my point of view, the role of the editors about the decision of an article is becoming more important in recent years as they have to decide very quickly and at the beginning of the review process about the possible impact of the paper and also over a large amount of articles. Do you agree with it? How many papers do you have to decide each day? And well, I think this is a very good question and how happy are you with it? <laughs> Who wants to go first on that one? Then? <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's different answers for different uh, all of us, right? So I think for uh, PRL in particular, I could, uh, so the question was how many papers do we receive and uh, the decisions we make? I mean, so approximately in PRL, a full-time editor is receiving approximately, I would say about 800 papers a year. And uh, then uh, about a third of them, they are not sending out to review. So the remainder is being sent to review. And uh, so of the papers, so we, of the 100 papers that we receive, so in other words, we end up publishing about 20%. So 80% of the papers are rejected, out of which 30 are rejected without review. So about half of the papers that arrive at PRL are sent to referees and subsequently rejected. So that's about 400 for a full-time editor. And not all papers take uh, the same amount of time. You know, some papers, decisions, either positive or negative are clear cut, logical, you know, happens without complications. But then, you know, they always say the 80-20 rule that 80%, 20 uh, percent of the papers take up 80% of your time. <laughs> so there are these complicated uh, scenarios where you, uh, so that's roughly, uh, and I forget there was a second part of the question, which uh, I have forgotten now. I think uh, last question is how happy you are. Is uh... How happy? Oh, that's, uh, I don't know. It's uh, <laughs> <laughs> the existential happiness of an editor. It's a complicated yeah. answer. Uh, I think as with any job, there are two. Yeah? One is the day-to-day uh, -day mechanics of your job, right? Whether you, you know, I mean, I, like I say, I mean, there are uh, friends of mine who are professors uh, who like, uh, you know, being at the STM machine uh, a lot, but they don't like the teaching part of their week, you know, and that's not a good mm -hmm. thing if you're a faculty member at a, at a university. It would be good if you were at a, you know, uh, at a research lab. And so I think there is a mechanical part of the job, which uh, speaking for myself, I thoroughly enjoy. I think most of our colleagues enjoy. And then, then the other parts of the job is to where is it located? So for example, our office, the PRL office is in Long Island. Uh, so some of you may be familiar with, we are in a very, uh, very close to Brookhaven National Lab. There may be some subset of people here who have been there. And um, we have a large staff. So in, in, in the office itself, our, 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 um, the extended office with all the journals, there are about 50, about 50 plus uh, uh, editors with you know, science PhDs and physics PhDs. And they're all, uh, I mean, we're talking pre-pandemic, of course. <laughs> so, and uh, a very large number of them uh, are now live in New York City. Uh, they would come and come out to our office uh, two, three days a week. And it's extremely international as with all of our organizations. So I would say that uh, pretty much, you, you know, you, any continent, uh, I think we have people from all continents and many, many different countries. It's a very eclectic set of people. And of course, you know, happiness is a complicated term. Who's to know who's happy or not, but they all seem to be satisfied with uh, what they're doing. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, all the wonderful things, for example, people who are very happy with being in an apartment in Brooklyn are, you know, now have been stuck in an apartment in Brooklyn for <laughs> six months. So, you know, hopefully all of this happiness question will have a different answer maybe six months from now. Um, so. So uh, I can answer, I can give a, a fast answer to, uh, to this questions. Um, so we, we have about, uh, we receive each year about 2000 uh, manuscripts and half of them are finally accepted, which means that if you do a rough calculation, don't count the weekends on per office day, it means that there are roughly speaking 10 manuscripts come in. Okay. And 
these are not arriving directly on my desk. So we have a staff editor in Mulhouse who, uh, who is sending it out to co-editors. And it arrives on my desk only if, if there is a problem attributing it to some co-editor or if there is any other problem that can be, which is not very often the case, or if there is finally an appeal to a decision that the co-editor made, okay, which, which are typically 15 to 20 cases per year. So you see in this direct editorial process, um, I'm not, my, my activity is not directly linked to the number of papers that come in. That, that's the, uh, the editors and it is the staff editor and the production editor. Okay, my activity is of course uh, very much uh, linked to uh, being at these kind of events, which makes me, by the way, very happy, which was the last question, and, uh, and, and, and many other things, also strategic uh, discussions inside our board of directors uh, about open access, about peer review, of course, because this is something that lives continuously each day, you know, so uh, we have to, to find solution each day to that. Um, for, for us, um, I think in part because each of our editors handles a much wider brief than I guess the average editor at Physical Review does. Um, we, we get probably 10 to 12 papers per week each, um, which means that we can spend a reasonable amount of time actually reading them carefully and reading the related literature carefully uh, before we make a decision. So, so our, our decisions tend not to be taken within half an hour or, you know, we have the luxury of being able to give four or five hours if we need to, to a, to a paper. We, we, we can kind of give them as, as long as they need to, to, to have a, a good decision with a sound rationale as we view it behind it. So in, in a sense, that's a bit of a luxury for us, I think, in, in comparison to, to some other journals. Um, frankly, that makes me quite happy, but partly because it means I get to learn the science uh, a lot more than, than I would if I was just kind of reading it quickly and, and scanning for keywords. Uh, not that I'm saying that anybody else necessarily does that, but but the fact that I can actually, you know, comprehend what I'm reading um, in some detail is is definitely definitely a perk. Um, the other part of the question was about how important editorial decisions are, um, and I don't know if that's necessarily getting more important over time. Um, certainly, for Nature Research Journal, so you know. Nature physics, nature materials, or arguably nature itself. Like, I think I think they would say that that's always been a part of the system. Uh, we we try very hard to have a you know have some kind of character to our journal. To, so you know we're not just trying to pick uh, the most technically excellent <clears throat> or whatever work. We're, we're trying to highlight and showcase a range of things across physics that we think the vast majority of physicists would like to read uh, would benefit from reading we're, we're really trying to highlight highlight cool work and so yes that that does give us a certain scope for our own subjectivity to manifest there and I think in a sense that's a that's a feature of, of how our system works rather than a bug we, we don't we don't really make a pretense that there's a kind of objective set of criteria that we that we can judge against because that's that's essentially impossible um, we're looking for things that make a big step forward uh, and are going to be appreciated by, by a wide range of physicists. And, and, you know, from that point of view, the editorial assessment there is, is, is important, but it has always been important, uh, at, least, at least for our, for our journal and, and, and for Nature too. Um, you can argue whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. And, you know, you can certainly argue about whether funding agencies and hiring committees and tenure committees basing their decisions on what we do is a good thing or not um, because as I say we're not we're not really making an effort to subject to select for objective scientific quality but um, but more for a range and a breadth and uh, you know a, a selection of good work to highlight uh, I, I hope that also slightly answers the question about the editorial role but um, yeah, I think I think that's a feature rather than a bug of, of how we do things. Okay. So 
I think if uh, seen, no, there are no more questions, so it was uh, really a, a pleasure to have three I of you. I see a question oh. from Herman, right? Oh. Yes, but uh, I'm too old, so I'm over 45. So, oh, okay. Are you not allowed to? <laughs> uh, it's up to someone if you want well, to. Well, it, it's fine. So, uh, yeah, it's a very good one indeed. So, yeah, you have been all the time talking about this, the quality of the paper or the scientific quality. So, what is what you consider uh, the quality of a paper? How is the unit where you measure the quality of a paper? It's, it's a pretty hard question, I guess. But That's a complicated one. I think so too, I'll tell you. So when I receive, and in many areas, it's very different, right? I mean, so for example, my assessment of papers that are kind of in my field, the whole thing is very different from, we have editors who handle papers from LIGO or handle papers from, uh, you know, the ATLAS collaboration where all of these questions and answers that you have to them are very different. I think, and again, in some areas which are extremely topical. So for example, I'll, you know, we have currently receiving a lot of papers on, let's say, uh, non-Hermitian physics or many body localization. These are very good papers from extremely successful researchers in large numbers, which simply didn't exist five years ago. I mean, this field was not. You know, and if you ask me if decisions or answers about quality of this or that individual paper is going to be correct in the long term, I will not be able to show you, right? So let's say we receive 50 papers, very likely 20 of them are very good, and we will end up publishing five of them, maybe. And to, to make any assessment as to whether this five was better than some other five, it's a tough one. So as an editor, I think there are uh, two main things that we look at. I mean, I, I would be worried. Firstly, from the review process, and this kind of bar differed a little bit, I think, at the beginning, is my big thing is I don't want to publish a paper which is incorrect, but in the sense that every practitioners in the field immediately will recognize it to be incorrect. And in particular, if referees were telling me that it's incorrect while they were reviewing the paper. So those are scenarios I do not want to, you know. And the other thing is, on the, at the same time, we don't want to, because of various subjective assessments, miss out on something which would be immediately useful and interesting for a very large number of people in the field. So those are the two. Um, for a particular paper at hand, what I'm trying to look at is, what do they exactly do? And you'll be surprised, and you can try out this exercise by looking at a bunch of papers in our journals. Sometimes, even in a reasonably uh, a good paper in the sense that it's addressing good science and doing significant stuff, it's often quite difficult to figure out what exactly did the authors do in that it's different from what people have done before. And assuming that it's correct, which is what the referees will tell us, why does it matter? Why, you know, in my case, I'm asking, so why should it not be in favor of B? What's the, you know, what's the thinking behind it? It's not, and that's, to me, a, a good paper is one that kind of immediately kind of makes its case to me and by extension to the referees as to why it matters, particularly if the field is a hot field where we are receiving very many good papers. So it, something has to stand out. And these are subjective issues. And uh, hopefully the journal makes broad, correct decisions over time so that when you look back with the benefit of hindsight, three, four years later, you think that, hmm, these guys made mostly correct decisions. That's, that's the way I look at it. I don't know, it was a rambling answer to a specific question perhaps, but there you are. It is very difficult to define or to measure the quality of a, of a scientific paper because in the end it will, it's the community that will tell you and it will take maybe 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, or even one century if you, if you want about the Higgs particle and so on. But uh, it, 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 I think originality is, is, is something that I think is very important in the quality of a paper. So what also Sami said, what, what makes this paper different than what the others did? That is so, so important because I see these days so many papers where they just change one parameter and publish again a paper. And it, it, that is for me, the category of boring papers. You know, you just change a parameter and do the same thing again. You know? uh, nobody publishes a new, uh, a new uh, Lagrangian, uh, a Ginsburg uh, Lagrangian, you know, or, or a, predict a new Higgs particle, why not? Eh? I mean, it's, uh, 
so many papers are just what I always call epsilon papers, where the progress is just epsilon. And, and, and that, that are for me a little bit the boring papers. They're not very interesting to read as a scientist either. It's originality. And fortunately, there are many original papers. So we're in either the luxurious or tyrannical position of publishing about 180 papers per year. So, you know, we get to be very selective if we want to. Um, so a kind of a shorthand that we use internally, there are different definitions to this shorthand, but, but the thing that we sort of say to each other when we're, when we're discussing papers uh, as an editorial team is what's the new physics? And what that means is, you know, what's the conceptual advance that's reported in the paper? What, what, what do we understand after it that we didn't understand before? What's the new thinking? And so to me, I think, at least for physics, uh, the very best papers are the ones that introduce a new way of thinking about a problem, uh, which is obviously very hard to do. Um, but I think that's, uh, you know, changing people's thinking is, is, is one way of tentatively defining, uh, I think, the very highest quality papers. So we just got the last uh, second question. So if all of you agree, maybe we can answer it and then we can proceed to close the session. So Saul is asking, how do you think the selection criteria of the articles affect to the study of concrete issues at the daily research? It is if they are relevant or if they are deal with certain topics, that some topics are preferentially developed and then some topics are fashionable and others that are more ignored. So can you comment on that? Yeah, I'll jump in. I was thinking about this in relation to the last question. I think one of the ways uh, PRL has a particular challenge. I mean, as, as uh, it, 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 we publish about 2,500 papers, like I said, we used to publish even more before. And sometimes fields come out of, as they say in the US, they come out of left field <laughs> where, um, you know, a very large number of papers get produced. So one clear example is graphene, right? So if you looked at uh, graphene in the early 2000s, there were no papers on graphene. The term, term was used in a different way. And then, you know, towards the end of the, uh, that decade, uh, PRL was receiving so many graphene papers and uh, publishing a very large number of them. I think we published about 200 plus a year. And uh, if you had looked at things like the impact uh, you know, citation numbers and so on, it was basically double of that of the journal at large. So there was a temptation to publish even more, right? And but then when you look back with the benefit of hindsight, the question is, you know, should we have published that many or did we overpublish? The answer probably is yes, we did overpublish. And the other challenge with something like a field like that, and this is how fields move around, it's not so much. So if you look at the output of graphene related research today, I would say it's probably more than even five years ago, but most of it is probably not physics in the traditional sense of the term. So if you go to a typical graphene conference and you look around, the people who are attending those conferences are not the same people who are coming to those conferences, you know, 10 plus years ago. So while the, uh, the sphere of people doing graphene research has grown, the overlap of that sphere of what one would term as PRL territory has shifted. And this is not, you know, it's not, and that's fine. I mean, that's something which is particular to that field. Whereas if you go to, for example, a conference on nuclear physics, for example, the shifting of those spheres is not so extreme. So these are different things in different fields. So when I think the term used here is fashionable, so it's not so much, there's fashionable, of course, what is fashionable, what's not fashionable is, but also focus of areas change. So if you think of physics as something we understand clearly, then is material science uh, physics, is it not? The thinking changes over time and uh, things move in and out. Um, but that's, that's what it is. I mean, that's, yeah. And I, just to build on that, I think it's interesting to, to consider to what extent editorial decisions drive what's perceived as fashionable and, what, and to what extent they respond to what a community sees as fashionable. And I genuinely think it's a bit of both. And 
you know, I, at least for the, you know, editors making an impact on, on what, what is or is not fashionable, I, I actually think that there's, there's a certain value in that in a limited way, which is that editors get to see an awful lot of science. They read probably more than most researchers do. And so they have quite a good overall impression of, of you know, where a field is. And so, you know, in a sense, with, with lots of practice and lots of experience, they're, they're not the worst people to be just kind of giving a little nudge here or a little steer there for, for a community for, for what's a, you know, interesting thing to work on. At the end of the day, of course, the community is going to decide. It's not the editors that, that are actually deciding, but just, just kind of highlighting this, promoting that, you know, there, there is a role there, I think, that, that editors can play in a, in a, in a constructive way. Uh, and I don't, I don't think that, um, that that's a bad thing, necessarily, because, as I, as I said, you know, we do have a reasonably broad view on, view on the, the topics that we handle. Yes, well, I, I can say that uh, EPL, uh, what I mentioned in my introduction, uh, is constantly looking out for high quality papers. Uh, so we are not in the luxury position of Nature and, and PRL. Uh, and so we are obliged to follow some kind of fashionable topics. And we decided uh, two years ago that we launch uh, each year uh, special issues of EPL on, uh, on fashionable topics such as uh, 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 quantum engineering, uh, neural networks, and now we have a special issue running on the turbulence in Bose-Einstein condensates. And uh, so in this case, we EPL is following the fashionable topics a little bit, but we are still open for, uh, for uh, ignore topics and uh, we 